Hi, everyone, again. Um, this is for the recorded folks as well. Welcome for joining. And welcome to uh, IOI's um, community discussion on assessing the financial health on, uh, of uh, nonprofits in the research and scholarship space. Um, I'm one of the facilitators today. My name is Emmy. I'm the engagement lead at IOI. Um, so very nice to meet you all. Just a little bit of logistics and housekeeping before we get started started. Um, as I said, this call is recorded. If you have any questions, we'll have a little bit of a presentation later. Um, if you have any questions during that presentation or at any time, please feel free to leave them in the Zoom chat. Um, questions regarding the presentation, there's a little section on the second page of the agenda towards the bottom, which where it says questions and suggestions. That would be a great place to put it so that we can get it all documented um, when, we, when we share it out as well. Um, but don't worry too much, we'll also copy things in um, in case they're in the Zoom chat. So that's for you to know. Um, in terms of the expectations for today, uh, we really would love to design this call as a place for learning and conversation. So we ask you to be curious, um, ask for clarifications where, where you would like them, um, ask the questions to challenge the way that we're thinking, hold space for others, be curious about others' perspective, and uh, hold space for each other to ask questions and contribute. And last but not least, be respectful. We want to build community and not tear it down. With that, um, we'd like to actually start, since this is quite a small group, uh, we'd like to start with a, a little bit of an introduction, like a sort of a, a rapid round of introductions, if you will. Um, so in a moment, we'll ask you all to sort of introduce yourself and noting that we are about 20 people in this room, um, keep it relatively short. So your name, uh, your affiliation or organization and what you do within that. So I can, uh, I think the I will loop in the IOI team to sort of give you an example of what that looks like. Uh, as I said, I'm, my name is Amy Tang. I'm the engagement lead at Invest Novo Infrastructure. Uh, handing it over to Caitlin. Hi, everybody. I'm Caitlin Thaney. I'm the executive director of IOI, and I'm glad you're here. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, Tanya. Hi, this is Tanya Hernandez. I'm a research data analyst at I IOI. Fabulous. Thanks, Tanya. All right, I'm going to start going across my screen and pointing names, so just be ready. Uh, Brian, if you could please. Hi, Brian Nosek. I'm executive director at the Center for Open Science and on the faculty at the University of Virginia. Welcome, Brian. And Kate? Hi, I'm Kate Motunaga. I'm the CFO for PLOS Public Library of Science. Thank you, Kate. Travis? Hi everyone, I'm Travis Rich. I'm the executive director at the Knowledge Futures Group. We build PubHub underlay doc maps and publish the commonplace. Fantastic, welcome. Lucy. Hi, I'm Lucy Ofeich. I'm the director of operations and finance for Crossref. Welcome, Lucy. Uh, Chris Shillam. Yeah, hi, Chris Shillam. I'm the executive director at ORCID. Thank you, Chris, welcome. And Dylan. Hi, my name is Dylan Riediger. I'm an analyst at Ithaca SNR. Thank you, Dylan. Roger. Hi, it's Roger Schoenfeld from Ithaca. Lovely to see you here, Roger. Fern? Hi, I'm Vern Ritter. I'm uh, with uh, Lyricis. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. Welcome, Fern. Uh, Chris Vanacore. Sorry for that. Um, I'm Chris Vanacor. I uh, am the controller of Ithaca and always interested in uh, benchmarking, which uh, I understand uh, this group uh, does do from time to time. Fabulous. Thanks, Chris. Mark. Hi, I'm Mark McBride, Associate Director at Ithaca SNR. Thank you, Mark. Bruce? Uh, Bruce Karen. I'm the Executive Director of the New Media Studio. Uh, I'm the Community Wrangler at the Earth Archive uh, preprint service and a longtime um, leader participant of Earth Science Information Partners. Thank you, Bruce. Kathleen. Hi, I'm Kathleen Fitzpatrick. I'm Director of Humanities Commons. 
Thank you, Kathleen. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Bowman, uh, product manager at Crossroad. Welcome. Johnny? Hi, I'm Johnny Liu. I'm the FPNA manager at PLOS Public Library of Science. Thank you, Johnny. Anne? Anne Britton, project coordinator, IOI. Thank you, Anne. Laura? Laura? Hi, I'm Laura Hanscom. I'm from the MIT Libraries, and I'm the head of scholarly, the Department of Scholarly Communications and Collection Strategy. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Lovely to have you here. Last but not least, Heidi. Hi, everyone. I'm VP of Communications for Ithaca. Thank you so much. Well, lovely to have you all here. Really, really grateful again for your time, and we're looking forward to a really exciting discussion. Um, so without further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Tanya Hernandez, who's gonna present a lovely work. Tanya. Thank you, Emmy. And I will share my screen now. Um, hi, um, thank you for being here today. And today I'm going to present uh, the overall design and elements of one of the current projects of IOI. This project focuses on uh, conducting an assessment on the financial health of nonprofits in research and scholarship within uh, the open research and open infrastructure ecosystem. And the primary goal of this analysis is to create indicators to function as baseline measures of nonprofit organizations within the open research ecosystem. Um, these baseline measures will help uh, to better understand uh, the organizational health and well being of the ecosystem. And um, this project has three specific goals. Uh, the first, uh, the aim is to perform an overall evaluation on the financial strength of the organizations in the ecosystem. Uh, second, this project is expected, is expected to identify the specific financial elements that will benefit from reinforcement at the organizational level. And third, uh, the project will facilitate financial information for decision makers within the ecosystem. Uh, for this study, we are focusing on 19 organizations that are providers and enablers in the open research ecosystem. All these organizations are tax exempt charities register in the United States under the 501c3 or the 501c6 provisions of the Internal Revenue Code. And right now, the time frame of this study is 2010 to 2019. Um, in terms of data, we are using the financial information reported by organizations to the Internal Revenue Service in Form 990. Um, as you probably know, these are annual reports. And specifically, we are using the information on sections 8, 9, and 10 uh, that have information on revenue for section 8, expenses for section 9, uh, liabilities and assets in section uh, 10. And we are using the financial ratio analysis to conduct this financial assessment. Uh, the financial ratio analysis has standardized measures and it has been widely used in the for-profit and recently also in the non-profit sector to assess the financial performance of organizations. Additionally, uh, and one of the main advantages of financial ratios are that they are really easy to replicate and communicate even for non-financial specialists. 
this is the complete list of ratios that we are working with. Um, and this combination really, uh, the idea with this uh, selection is to diagnose short-term and long-term financial health of organizations in the ecosystem. And in the next slides, I will elaborate on some of these ratios a little bit more. This is, for instance, uh, one of the examples of the ratios. This is programming service revenue reliance. Uh, this, this ratio, for instance, measures uh, an organization's reliance on program service revenue. In other words, to what degree the organization depends on the revenue that comes from the delivery of services and programs. And you know, the formula is really easy. You divide the total of programming service revenue over the total revenue that an organization receives in a given year. And based on the widely used standards, ideally this ratio should be below 0.6, and it needs attention when it's above 0 0.75. Um, in this example, uh, hypothetical, uh, an hypothetical case, if an organization has 8 million in programming service revenue and a total revenue of 10 million, then the ratio for this case will be 0 0.8. And this is above the 0 0.5 desired threshold. This is the reason why this case will be will will receive a red flag, meaning that the organization relies so heavily on the revenue that comes from the delivery of programs and services. Now the next three slides uh, present how this ratio analysis will look like for 10 years of analysis. And for these examples, uh, we use PETA, the Animal uh, Rights Organization. And here's again, uh, here's again the example of the ratio programming service revenue reliance that measures to what degree the organization depends on the revenue that comes from the delivery of services and programs. And in this case, uh, PITA does not rely on program uh, service revenue. You can hardly see, but the amount of programming uh, service revenue is around half million per year. Um, in this case, the organization will be black as green in this specific ratio because it does not rely on uh, the revenue that comes from services and programs. However, this is also a great example to, to show because probably the next question that we will ask, okay, but what's the revenue uh, the organization rely the most? And probably in this case for PETA will be contributions. And then we will kind of the goal of ratio analysis is to be used as uh, as, as a group of ratios, not, not only use one ratio to, to grade all the organizations. And another ratio uh, is leverage ratio that measures how heavily the organization relies on debt. And the two elements that we need to calculate this ratio are liabilities at the end of the year and assets at the end of the year. And this ratio needs attention when it's above um, 0 0.10. For PETA, this ratio is way above 0 0.10. This means that this organization will receive a red flag, meaning that the organization relies so heavily on debt to operate. And the last example, it's the fundraising expense ratio. Uh, that measures the percentage of an, of an organization's expenses on fundraising cost. Ideally, this ratio should be below 0 0.10. Uh, on average, uh, uh, PITA has a ratio of 0 0.15. 
and the ratio only needs attention when it's above 0 0.725. Um, uh, uh, then uh, this case will be marked with probably a yellow flag because it's above, it's a little above the desired threshold. And um, now ratio analysis has some challenges and we, we believe it's important to acknowledge those challenges. Uh, first, uh, ratios has been, have been historically used to evaluate the performance of the for-profit sector. This means that most of them focus on profit maximization rather than quality of services and programs. For the thresholds in niche ratio, also the parameters were usually established for older and medium uh, to large organizations. Um, in order to tackle those challenges, um, in this study, uh, IOI has the opportunity to follow the specific guidelines for organizations in the nonprofit sector. Um, this approach is expected to help reducing the bias on the thresholds. And we are also triangulating uh, the guidelines provider, provided for uh, nonprofit practitioners, specialists in the nonprofit sector, as well as academics uh, that specialize on the behavior and financial performance of organizations in the nonprofit sector. Um, lastly, and summarizing this presentation, uh, the overall uh, goal of this work is to produce initial information on the financial health of the organizations in the open research and open infrastructure ecosystem. And uh, the product of this work will be a report on the results of the financial ratio analysis. And we plan to communicate these measures in a way that they are easy to replicate for organizations and also can function as self-evaluation tools. And also all this information is expected to help and be used by decision makers within the field to inform uh, the decision making process regarding the financial uh, health of organizations. Um, thank you so much for your attention. And now we are open to your questions, feedback, and reaction on this and reactions on this study. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, Folks, uh, in the meantime, I see that questions have come up in the uh, shared document. Thank you so much for those. Um, if you have additional questions now, um, please feel free to continue adding them to that list that is currently hovering around the top of page three on the document. I see something coming in from the Zoom chat as well. I'll make sure that's captured as well. But um, just to kick us off, uh, this question and answer sort of section of the, of the session, um, if you, uh, reading that first question there, I wonder if, because um, we discussed this a little bit internally in the team, Caitlin, if you would like to um, sort of, you know, give us uh, your, your thoughts, share, share our thoughts. And uh, yeah, so the question is, what evidence is there to suggest that an, an initial focus on US 501c3 or 6 uh, will provide information about the broader financial health of scholarly infrastructure ecosystem and what considerations have been given to the biases that this may introduce. Yeah, Hayden. no, it's a it's a great question. And thank you, Tanya, for the work that you're doing. Um, also, just to reiterate, I know that this is the first time that we're sharing out something that is more on not just reporting initial pieces of fact. I know many of you participated in our COI's work for that, um, you know, for that reason where we had shared things out in a specific way. Um, and so just a reminder to keep the keep the questions and the comments as, um, as constructive as possible so we can further build on this work too. Um, the, in terms of why we had the initial focus on 501c3s and 501c6s in the US, um, the availability of information was the main thing that we are working on. Um, when we were building out our uh, understanding that led to the development of 
the catalog of open infrastructure services or what we refer to as COIS, um, we used kind of a similar methodology of drawing an initial subset of projects from the scholarly communications catalog, SCOMCAT, another open resource, and using that to start to build out our model. Um, a similar aim here in terms of looking at uh, various organizations that we know in the space, but that also that we can get the financial information on and also through the uh, available public tax filings. The aim of this is definitely to be able to extend this beyond the 501c3 sort of space because we recognize that many projects are incubated like ourselves and fiscal sponsors, um, be they institutions or separate organizations. Um, we also know that in other parts of the world, there are different uh, charity regulations, different um, setups in various ways, and other dimensions that we um, need to be mindful of. And so that's sort of seen as the further extension of this work once we sort of not only get through refining this analysis and sharing it out so that we can understand what questions we need to ask for those other projects where public filings might not be as readily available as US, as US 501c3s and 501c6s through 990s and through other documentation. I can Thanks, take it. Yep. I can take number two. Uh, what work, yeah, the question is what work has been done to determine the financial ratios, the organizations that are being assessed actually use on a day-to-day -day basis to manage their finances? Yeah, um, we exactly, I mean, uh, this is actually a good space to know more about the, the ratios that organizations use in a daily operations. And uh, the list of 10 ratios that I presented, I meant to um, assess short-term and long-term sustainability, but um, this is a great opportunity to, to know more about the ratios that you used for monthly reports, for, I don't know, reports every semester, or that you have found more useful also for annual assessments. Yeah, and I would say just to build on that, we do have additional time for this conversation. That's exactly the sort of information that would be really helpful. Um, I know also that Tanya is working on wrapping up her analysis. And so that sort of discussion with uh, the projects that we are analyzing following that analysis being completed um, is definitely still part of that process as well. So that would be great feedback for us as well. I mean, that Thank you. you. Thank you both, and feel free to sort of uh, follow that up on the um, on the doc as well. Um, just seeing, Kaylin, I don't know if you want to first oh, follow up. Yeah, the follow up um, on question one there about biases. in terms of question on biases. Um, so the analysis is also worth noting. The analysis that we're working on now, in terms of modeling our approach. We are looking in terms of how that is to be used, using it not only to inform our research methodology, but also for future consideration of engaging and I guess embedding that information in the catalog of open infrastructure services. Um, this is also part of our exploration in terms of metrics and other indicators for, for lack of a better phrase, that we might want to be including in when we talk about making funding recommendations on behalf of IOI. And so, you know, we do recognize again that there is bias in this focusing on US-based organizations. Um, we know, and we've uh, also been clear in our, our blog posts and our outreach that, you know, organizations such as PLOS versus organizations such as Crossref you know, the, the remit for this is also beyond our usual specific focus on open infrastructure providers. So you can make an argument that PLOS has done significant amount in that space. Um, and so, you know, that is something that we are looking at further building on once we have this analysis refined. So yes, we recognize that there is bias in focusing only on US-based organizations. It's due to data availability. If we had access to the other information at our fingertips, that would have been part of our initial analysis. If you have access to or have ideas as to how we might be able to get that information to do that analysis, we'd love to hear them. Um, but that is sort of additional outreach and um, additional phases of this work that we're, we're planning on. Thank you, Caitlin. I can take number three. Um, 
what work, uh, the question is what work has been done to determine uh, if the proposed pro of the standards are specifically useful for analyzing uh, the financial health of scholarly infrastructure organizations. I mean, as opposed to say public charities. And uh, this is a great question. And um, this is also one of the goals of this analysis to have kind of a standards to analyze organizations within the ecosystem. Right now we are using the standards for traditional charities in the nonprofit sector, but with the hope to, to identify which are the desired measures within the, the open research and open infrastructure ecosystem. That's kind of the goal of the project as well. Thanks, Tanya. I see Chris has a hand. Um, yeah, if I could just jump in there. I mean, I think, I think that, oh, can you hear me guys okay? Yeah. Um, the, the, the point about making, using this work to figure out what ratios make sense for this kind of analysis makes perfect sense, right? But I think you can already see in the questions that, that um, you know, your proposal to at the same time before having done that work, pass judgments on some of those ratios when you're not sure if those ratios are applicable, seems maybe you're getting ahead of yourselves and maybe that should be a piece of work that would be best conducted as a follow-on. There are already, you know, a number of us have said, well, your proposed um, ratio, your uh, band for uh, program service revenue ratio doesn't make sense for our kind of organizations. I think when I read your blog post, you had the same kind of um, ban for staff expense ratio, which again, if for organizations providing services, that's what we spend our money on. So I think it might be, you know, something to think about is to split this up into a couple of phases, gather the data, have a further discussion with the community, see what you've learned before publishing kind of judgments on the financial health of organizations where there doesn't appear to be much in the evidence base that the, uh, you know, figures that you're proposing to measure correlate with financial health organizations. Yeah, just to jump in on that, Chris, um, that is the plan in the same sort of way that when we put the first um, iteration of the catalog of open infrastructure services out, you know, there were similar sorts of pieces of financial information that were reported about reliance on different forms of revenue. Right. And we refrain from not only well, not only first engaging with those that were helping to provide that information about the information we were making available, but also refraining from saying that one was right and one was wrong because context matters quite specifically if you are cross rep versus public project right. Um, and so just to clarify there, um, this is longer term aspiration is thinking about how these sorts of metrics because we do know that there is a dearth of information in the space that is guiding these sorts of decisions, right? That's why IOI exists. Thinking of where we can start to create, you know, forms of analysis that can give us better understandings and also take into consideration that context before we, you know, get into a place where we're passing any sort of judgment. And um, we take that really seriously. So I, I just want to clarify that we're not um, looking to do that in the interim without more public review, sharing out of the information and also taking into consideration that context. And um, it's part of why we're building out the research and analysis team in the way that we are so that we have more dedicated support there. And we're not just relying on the data, but mixing, uh, having a mix of qualitative and quantitative research on this as well. That's a great point. Okay. I mean, should we dig into the program service revenue question? Because I think that there are some really interesting points that remain about that. Yeah, I was just about to say, and it relates to yeah. what you've, you've just related as well. So uh, do you want to make a start, uh, Tanya? Tanya, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the comments in the, um, in the document about the program service revenue element? I know that there are a number, just to kind of um, capture some of the higher level points, a number of organizations that have said that program service revenue you know, they, they interpret reliance on that as a little bit different than it being more of a, a risk um, in terms of reliance on earned revenue, diversifying away from grants. Mm -hmm. And I know from your expertise in nonprofit um, management and assessment, I wondered if you wanted to shed some light on that topic. Mm -hmm. Then we can open it for discussion too. Yeah, 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 definitely. Going back to, it's kind of um, 
um, the mixture of ratios that we selected aim to um, diagnose how how heavily I mean the, the mixture of uh, revenue and also expenses that organizations um, have. So specifically, uh, we know that uh, organizations within the sector probably rely uh, on grants uh, and um, that receive from funders. So we are conscious about that. And uh, even though we, we propose some um, uh, desired thresholds, we are also, um, as, as, as uh, we presented, uh, this, we, we will be sensitive about how uh, we present this information and that the ratios that we use are usually designed for bigger, established, larger organizations. The goal is not to penalize organizations that are just starting on, or that relied on a specific uh, model of funding, but to kind of diagnose the overall uh, status of the ecosystem. I see Kate has a hand. Hi, yeah. because. I, I'm still having a little bit of a concern regarding this because we are a ten, you know, we're a, we're an older organization. We're forty million dollars. We're not a startup, and we purposefully we don't even have a development department. We don't do grants and fundraising, so we do earn. Um, the reason we're a nonprofit is because we then give away all of the information that we gather. So. You know, if you're going to say a red flag is this on revenue and then a red flag is this on employees, you basically just said if we ever wanted to go into funding that we would be completely marked out. So I'd really like you to revisit the assumption that earned revenue is a negative. I think that is very problematic. I think Tanya's like making notes. Kate, Kaitlin, do you want to jump in? No, I was going to say I saw Chris raise a hand. Yeah, I think on that vein, um, I'm reminded of one of the, the POSI principles that uh, ongoing work should not be done with one-time funding, which I strongly subscribe to, right? And I think a lot of us that strive to provide sustained services that are going to go on to perpetuity have deliberately tried to set up sustained revenue streams, right? And specifically don't... Um, um, rely on one-time sources of funding. So I think there's some contradiction in that proposal. You had to look at that ratio with, I think, one of the really important uh, POSI principles. Um, Brian, maybe? Before. Just reinforcing what Chris just said. Organizationally, we have historically been dependent on grants and we consider that a major risk. Uh, we are trying to establish uh, better earned revenue, uh, like our more mature established uh, colleagues, uh, because of the predictability uh, and the ability to weather uh, variation uh, in inevitable grant cycles uh, across things. So uh, I would love to be 100% earned revenue if the earned revenue was mission aligned. Yeah, I agree. I think that that is a place that most of us aspire to. So thank you for pointing that out. It did not mean to um, surface that sort of um, um, level of concern, Kate, and we'll be sure that we take that back to the research team to further it. Tanya, is there anything there more that you wanted to talk about in terms of program service revenue, maybe how that's interpreted versus earned revenue, which I know is seen as more sustainable in the nonprofit space? Yeah, kind of the ideal theoretical right uh, and again it's not the goal is not to penalize organizations but ideally it's that organizations does an organization does not rely on any type of revenue right that have a mixture that uh, will make organizations sustainable at the long term even if they lose one revenue or two revenues then that's kind of the the goal is to have a balance uh, however, uh, we also understand how uh, the funding models work for the organizations in the ecosystem. So we will be uh, conscious about that when um, analyzing the information. Um, 
Thank you all. I just want to flag, you know, that this is really important for our learning. And I, I just want to say, like, really thank you for all of you for, for you know, flagging that and, and making sure that we're, we're definitely taking notes here to make sure that we can, you know, go back and, and rethink some of this. And hopefully, you know, um, as we um, commit to de developing iteratively, invite you all back again. And, and, um, and I'm very grateful that you would continue to support this work, hopefully. Um, Chris, you have a hand? Sorry, I don't want to dominate the conversation. So other people feel free to jump in. But just to come back to that point, you know, I think diversity of revenue is, is an important uh, point to consider. But, you know, I think several of us um, who are on the call um, have diversity within our pro program service revenue portfolios, right? So there are different ways of diversifying revenue other than looking at kind of the gross uh, funding type. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great piece. Tanya, let's um, mark for the next sort of research meeting to explore how we can get to additional levels of uh, detail within the program service revenue component. That's a great flag. Thank you. Um, Tanya, do you feel comfortable moving on to question five? Yeah. Um... Yeah, question five uh, about the cash on hand uh, for some of the ratios. Um, yeah, um, kind of the, uh, my answer to question number hey, Tanya, five will be- can I ask that you just read it out for the recording? Yeah, so yeah, sure, sure, sure. Federal funding does not allow, the question is federal funding does not allow cash uh, withdrawals that will create cash on hand. Uh, but uh, there may be significant cash ready to use uh, held in the federal account. Um, cash on hand for uh, the rest of, of you, cash on hand uh, is useful for some of the ratios. And it's, uh, um, it's used as a measure of uh, sustainability at the short term. Uh, and again, uh, we know that these ratios probably will not picture a great image for specific organizations. Kind of the goal is not to study organizations case by case, but more to diagnose the status of the ecosystem. Uh, probably, yeah, some organizations will not look great on this specific uh, input. Uh, but again, that's kind of not the goal, rather than uh, exploring and diagnosing uh, uh, the, the sector. I think just to add to that too, um, as Tanya had said in your analysis, you know, we know that these measures are better than what we have now, which is pretty minimal. Um, in terms of looking across the ecosystem, but also we know that they come with their own challenges. And I know that there's a question further down about will we be sharing or reaching out to projects before we, you know, share information? Of course, um, that is, you know, we exist to kind of advocate on behalf of the projects. Um, it's how we approached our previous work around uh, the catalog and how we will continue to do so. And again, you know, not looking to surface this information in a way that penalizes projects, um, anything that we do in terms of how this will be kind of factoring into funding arrangements is to be determined. And we're gonna be focusing on that work in the next year of our development in terms of how does this information come together for funding recommendations that not only still honors our you know, commitments and our values and our mission, also advocating on behalf of the open infrastructure community, as well as you know understanding where there needs to be additional transparency, accountability, acting on data as it, as it exists. Thank you. Um, thank you all for, for contributing directly on the notes as well. I really appreciate it. Um, moving on to uh, question six, Tanya, I wonder if you would like to uh, give it a go. I can sort of verbalize the question here first. Um, can you also explain the judgments you are planning to make around staff expense ratio? 
Yeah, basically the expense ratio are, um, and we will be also sharing that with you, the specific lines that we are using of Form 990 to calculate the ratios, but basically exp uh, staff expense ratio is based on the full-time staff, not contractors. So contractors will be not counted in, uh, in that uh, measure. Honey, I think asking about the, the judgment. So like, how would that necessarily affect the financial health? I mean, how, yeah, yeah. Kind of the, the, the goal here is to explore how much uh, or to what degree an organization invest in, in personnel and how much of this represents on the total expenses of uh, the organization. Would it be fair to say, just before kind of getting into it, Chris, I know, for example, like our colleagues um, at SCOS, uh, who also focus on sustaining the broader ecosystem, how there's a focus on operational income versus developmental income, say, or developmental investment in terms of technical expense. Um, is this also to give a better idea as to like what sort of funding priorities an organization may have or um, in terms of staff versus, say, technical expense or are there other things you're comparing that against? Tanya, do you want to answer that one? Oop, you're muted. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, um, sorry, w w should we move to number seven? Maybe Kellen, you want to Okay, sure. do you want to move yeah, on? No, I think at least from uh, from our perspective, making sure that we have a better understanding of, because I, again, I will say like for IOI, our investment in terms of uh, staffing, that is we are a research focused organization, right? We have very little in terms of technology that we are um, building out and maintaining, though that may change. And so, you know, again, the context I think is really key and to have a better understanding as to where those dependencies are. Chris, I see your hand up again. Uh, yeah, I actually had a, a question on that. And, and okay. I think in your blog post, you actually quoted, uh, again, a needs attention number for the staff expense ratio. And I was wondering if you could remind us what that, uh, what that number was. Tanya, do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, when you say the expense ratio, OK. The, the, I think you called it. The personnel expense ratio, I think you mm -hmm, called it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, measures, yeah, it's total salaries, uh, wages, and benefits over total revenue. Well, uh, I've actually, I found it now. I was, trying to, I was trying to Google the post. I think you said um, that would require attention if it was over 70%, mm -hmm. which again, I think for, you know, that I can imagine that applies to you know public charities that are dispersing a lot of their funds mm -hmm. um for infrastructure organizations it would seem that at least i know orchid spends most of its money on staff and i imagine a number of our other organizations do as well so it, it, it seems to me that there's some work needed to be done to figure out what's an appropriate uh, in fact what does that even tell us about you know infrastructure organizations yeah no totally and again um Kind of, I, I would like to emphasize once again that the goal, I know, I mean, we are looking at the organizational level uh, for these ratios. However, kind of the goal is not to say, or guide, or this specific organization is doing badly in these ratios, but rather diagnose the ecosystem. Probably I know that these flags um, look problematic. Probably that's something that we will consider to not to put flags and rather than um, again emphasizing the group of organizations rather than pointing out. Lucy? Um, yeah, I, I agree with Chris and I also just want to note that if there is, if you are distinguishing between contractor costs and staffing costs, I think in some cases that's actually greater risk if a lot of your tech is run um, by contractors and you don't have that continuity of 
um, support on the staff side that so I would say if you do keep the ratio I might include contractors in it to the extent that they're doing the work that you would otherwise have to staff folks to do yeah thank you for that uh, we will consider that thank you Lucy uh, Travis um this is maybe a little bit of a meta question so sorry if I'm sort of jumping the queue at all but but looking down the list of the blog post and and uh, hearing some of y'all's questions, it, looking down, it's like, woof, this is going to be rough for us, <laughs> you know, for a bunch of things. There's going to be a bunch of red flags, um, partly because we're young, partly because the space is difficult. And I find myself going back and forth on, do I want all of our all of everyone's metrics on this call to be red flags to make the point that like, hey, this space is really difficult, and clearly these very necessary, very smart groups are in a position where they're all doing quote unquote terribly, and therefore funders, you guys should show up and like do something other than what you've currently been doing, or do we want all of us to be green flags and be like, no, we're peachy, we're good, let's all follow exactly what the smart folks at Plus and Orchid are doing, or, or something else. And so I'm curious if you guys had advice on what I should be rooting for for myself. Do you think a red flag will get folks to give us attention and some help? Or do you think it'll sort of, you know, uh, put us on the naughty list? Um, and then and then also curious, uh, if do you have any thoughts on like ecosystem, you keep talking about a, a sense of the ecosystem's um, health. Are there, are there ecosystem level measures that would be helpful that um, are maybe organization agnostic that are saying like, oh, look, overall, none of these groups have more than a five-year runway, and that's probably not good for something as important as what we do. Yeah, um, just to comment on that, Travis, you, the last part of what you just said hits on how we're framing this. So I know that some of you have been also, uh, you know, kind of following along our hidden costs work that was funded by the Mellon Foundation, which led to the development of poise, but also an underlying sort of current of building out this research. Um, we take a deliberate sort of asset framing mindset at, at IOI of what we're looking to enable. So this sort of research, one way of seeing it might be thinking of the flags, right? Let's take the flags out of it. Um, more so indicators for us about where there are core needs, where there are things that funders should know in terms of, say, you know, understanding the ecosystem of the dependency on certain levels of staff percentages where it might be different than what we would otherwise see in the nonprofit ecosystem, right? And this is where that the work that Tanya is doing is helping to um, provide a better understanding for that. Um, or to say, as we saw with the research from last fall um, and looking and working with the 10 organizations, some of which are represented here about needs for additional investment in community engagement in working with local organizations or those that are on the ground to help, you know, embed and increase adoption of technologies, um, legal funds, et cetera. So those are the pieces of information that like what might be kind of captured as flags in the um, presentation really are places for us to have additional investigation so that we can help provide more support and more robust thinking for funders, for institutional leaders, for others to direct resourcing to organizations like yours, um, but also understanding the reality of the ecosystem and, and where those current lie, where those current realities lie, if that's helpful. Brian. That was great. I'll also just add from the perspective of infrastructure provider, I'm very pro flags uh, when they are providing some insight for us in terms of self-accountability, some comparative information, and then ideally some community bolstering that if I see, oh, this organization has really nailed it on these things, and that's where we seem to be struggling, that's who I'm going to reach out to for advice, help, guidance, uh, in addition to all of the other things that you talked about in the broader community. So I, I think if we get these uh, in the right track, I think there'll be a real benefit for the community. Thank you for that. Um, and I know we're coming up on time, but just to further kind of add to that too, in terms of having that your point, Travis, about the you know short-term nature of some of the funding as well. This sort of analysis of being able to say, you know, this is a sort of dependency on these sorts of revenues at this sort of phase, we notice a dip, etc. It allows for us to go and have 
coordinating conversations with the funders that are um, supporting us to do this work to say, okay, why? Like, do we need to extend this so that it's not just the three to five years, but that we have more sustained funding mechanisms and doing the research to build out on that too. Um, we'll be sharing more about that in the in the next few months for sure as well, because we've got some additional elements of our research we'll be bringing to light that'll help kind of situate this as well. So these comments are super helpful. Thank you, Brian and Caitlin. Um, there's a follow up on the same question uh, mm -hmm. regarding um, if you, we have spoken with funders who have expressed how they would use the, this reporting. Do you want to quickly jump on that? Yes, I do. Um, and also about IOI publishing its own figures on its financial position. We're in the process of doing so. Um, we're actually standing up a financial oversight group, which will be there to not only help us, we currently already publicly disclose all the money that comes into IOI, but they'll be working with us over the next year to help us publish all of the things that come out of IOI and the additional reporting there too, so we can really live those values. Um, and so that's a separate governance mechanism that will be working with us to help not only, um, you know, go through this analysis as well, but also to be more open about our own finances in various ways. Um, to the uh, question about Sorry, Emmy, I lost it in terms of about whether uh, we would publish our own figures or no, that no, you the, the next one. question, the one that you had as well. Yeah, sorry, uh, whether um, we uh, we have ideas of how funders would um, oh, yes. perhaps yes. make use of this information. Thank you. Um, we have a user experience researcher right now who's running a series of focus groups with um, institutional funders and also philanthropic and government funders that were part of focus groups for the development of the catalog last fall, as well as an expanded list moving beyond um, North America and UK and, and Europe. Um, those those interviews are not only to look through like the use of information currently in employees, but also to better understand how they would want to be acting on information, including this sort of analysis. That research is due to wrap up in um, early September, and so then we'll be sharing out our learnings from that as well. But yes, there have been initial, you know, asks for additional understanding of you know, what risk looks like, what criticality looks like, and what are the needs for funding in various ways. And we're using this to help add some additional um, levels of understanding and seeing, you know, what is most useful when we start to put the information together. Um, but again, we will do that with the community's input, uh, not necessarily looking to make a case without that important level of conversation as well. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at time and we are about five minutes to the end. Uh, and there, there are still so many interesting questions that we could address. I wonder if um, maybe, I, I will, and we will try to make sure that we get these addressed asynchronously in the notes document. That's, let's first say this uh, so that don't worry, um, we'll, we'll give answers where we can. Um, but I wonder if uh, Caitlin, you wanna go ahead and, and pick one that you would like to address just here and um, we can sort of, and with that for, for the session. Sure, sure. Um, I will, how about this? I'll try to go through as many as I can in a short period of time. Um, in terms of the timeline for making results accessible, Tanya's gonna be working to wrap up this analysis for end of August. Um, Emmy, that get, then gets handed over to Emmy and our Director of Research and Strategy for our review process and for sharing out. And I would say that that would be over the month of September. Um, Emmy, give me a thumbs up that is in line with the plans that we discussed. And so we'll be um, in touch in you know, the next month or so regarding the additional details there. Um, in terms of uh, the technical issue, yes, I am aware that the IRS is quite far behind in publishing 990s. Um, we are in active dialogue with the folks that release the data, um, as well as those who clean the data, as well as those who um, are also hitting the same sort of issues with this. Um, this is why the analysis is through 2019, um, because for some organizations, the 2020 990 data is still not yet published um, unless they made it available on their own without it going through the IRS. So yes, we are aware that there is a significant delay. Um, and again, if you have other data sources that you think we should be looking at, please, we, we love data. We would love for that to be sent. Um, if there's a magic bullet, please send it our way. Um, and then in terms of um, opportunities for establishing benchmarks on efficiency and impact, um, 
That's a really interesting question. Um, we will be sure to take that back to our research team uh, so that we can further discuss expanding. And if you have ideas for other indicators that you think would be useful um, and they can be creative out of the box ones as well, you know, this work that Tanya has been leading is very much anchored in some of the best practices in nonprofit management and assessment. Um, we are always looking for other areas to expand our analysis. Um, and I think that goes for the next one as well about ecosystem level measures that be valuable beyond organization specific ratios. Um, we'd love to continue that conversation. And I mean, maybe we can put a pin in um, having a, an additional dialogue once this analysis is made public about what some of those ecosystem wide indicators would be. I hope that didn't go too fast through this very rich piece of, piece of work. I know this is not always the easiest thing to kind of dive into, and I'm really grateful for you all um, helping turn this over with us. It's really helpful. 100 percent. I would like to second that and say just thank you so much for for sharing all your thoughts here. It's really, really valuable for you know this work moving forward. And is is you know we we are here to um, work with you all, and that's that's what we really, really want to do with this. And so uh, thank you for for joining us, and uh, let us know how we can do that better as well. So uh, in terms of just rounding off next steps, which I think Caitlin has and, and Tanya has already mentioned quite a few of those, we have a lot of questions that you all have graciously provided that we have to uh, go back and look at, obviously. Um, but also uh, we are definitely interested in looking at outside sort of the US context. Um, uh, in particular, I think uh, we've been you know, contemplating Europe and um, especially you know, the UK, but again, hugely dependent on where we can get our hands on data that uh, we can analyze. So that's definitely something that we're thinking uh, quite deeply about and very excited about as well. Um, in terms of uh, looking at uh, uh, the catalog of open infrastructure services, which we uh, have mentioned quite a few times already in this call, um, definitely with a plan to look at how we can integrate this analysis in, in the near future into that product and um, and yeah, looking at how, you know, it could help you help all of us tell a more uh, complete story about the, the work that we've been doing within our organizations to our key stakeholders. So um, more to come, I'll say if you, uh, I've just quickly dropped our research email address in the agenda as well, and uh, just capture this on videos, research at investinghoofin.org. If you have any further thoughts as well, we would love to hear from you there. Um, and and uh, try, trying our best to uh, um, improve on our work as well through that way. Um, there is also a mailing list that you could subscribe to in case you don't want to miss what's going to come out next uh, in the near future. So that's just to put it there as well for you all to uh, re refer to. Um, with that, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for, for your time um, and uh, for your support. And love to see you and have a good day. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Tanya, for sharing out your work. Have a good one, guys. Thanks for, Thanks for joining us. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks,